folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. And sorry for the technical difficulties. These things happen with live streaming. But we are continuing. Well, we're starting, really, our aviation in the Pacific uh, second week. We had a first week a few months ago. And it's quite heavy on kind of the bombing of Japan, uh, which you would imagine would be a big subject. We have two shows coming your way tomorrow about the atomic side of things. Paul Ham in the morning, that's UK time, and Kit Chapman in the evening UK time. But today I'm delighted to bring this guest in because, frankly, I don't know why I haven't been able to bring him on before. He has taught, you name it, he's taught there, the US uh, Command and Staff College, Fort Leavenworth. He's currently moved to the World War II Museum in New Orleans, alongside some friends of mine. And Dr. John Caratola is going to come on today and talk about the bombing of Japan. So I'm delighted to have him on. So good afternoon, John. How are you today? I'm doing well, sir. And yourself? Very. You're, you're a little bit sitting in the dark. But we've got audio now, so that's good. So um, that's, that's I don't know what's going on there. I'll drop the shade here so we can see a little bit better. There we go. Yeah, yeah that's better. There we go. So Wonderful. you've... Before we begin this presentation, you've just started working at the World War II Museum. How is that going for you alongside some friends of mine? Yes, it's going brilliantly. I've, I've been felt very welcomed. I'm very excited about the job, and it really seems like a, a fun place to work. Um, trying to get acclimatized to the humidity in New Orleans, that's something new and unusual for me. But um, having spent four years in the Pacific, it uh, kind of brings back some old memories, too. Right, yeah. And I, I forgot to say, of course, you were a, a Marine officer. So, the subject of the aviation Pacific, and particularly with the strategic bombing, it's one of those subjects that kind of gets reanalyzed every few years. People have a new spin on it, new take on it. But you have been doing a variation of this presentation for several years now. Are your are your conclusions and findings exactly the same now in 2022 as they were when you started? Yeah, I I, I think so because what I'm what I see a lot of discussions that goes on is a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking. Um, you have to take into consideration what do the American air commanders know at the time and how is that driving their decision-making processes? Um, we can kind of sit back now through the, through history and go, well, we know the Japanese were near defeat. We know that they had some all kinds of problems, but you don't know that if you're Kurt LeMay, if you're Hap Arnold, if you're Haywood Hansel, you know, uh, or, or for that matter, if you're Harry Truman or FDR, mm -hmm. depending on what timeline you want to be. Um, and so when you look at it from a perspective of what these commanders knew at the time, uh, it gives you some insight as to the decisions that they made in 1945, not what we know today about the state of the Japanese war industries, you know, in the spring of 45. Um, I also think uh, to a certain extent, there are some uh, political motivations that are that involve this that we like to think as military practitioners it's all about tactics and you know and use of force but there's some politics involved here in this air campaign too that i'll talk a little bit about uh, as we go forward today no definitely and, and it's 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 a subject that, that can have more than one opinion i've had different guests on over the yeah. years talking about this ian w toll has been on paul ham tomorrow james m scott's been on about it john mcmanus Everybody has slightly different opinions on things because at the end of the day, history is all about opinions. And like everything else, we've all got one. So you've come on with a pretty extensive PowerPoint. So we'll do that. We'll kind of do questions as they as we kind of go along today, folks. So we just fire away at, at John as we go along. But I'm going to hand over to him to take us through this. And Whirlwinds of Flame is probably the one of the most exciting titles for a show <laughs> I've had in a few weeks. But um, uh, so the strategic bombing uh, campaign against J uh, Japan, over to you. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. And and I, I do like the, the idea of having people uh, pepper questions as we go through, because it might provide some context to anything that I might be saying here. So please feel free. And I agree with you that there are different interpretations uh, of this effort. Uh, these just happen to be mine based upon um, my archival research. Just to give you a little bit of a background, this was part and parcel of my dissertation uh, research back in uh, 2009 when I defended and, uh, and I've grown a little bit more uh, as I've uh, studied air power a little bit more. Yes, you're absolutely right. I'm a Marine officer who studies the Air Force who worked for the Army for a while. So I'm kind of all over the place. Um, but I, I find this campaign intriguing because you start to see, and again, in my opinion, technology driving strategy as opposed to strategy driving technology uh and and i'll talk about that here as we go along so 
with that. Um, what I'll talk about, well, the advent of strategic bombing theory. We'll talk about the airframe itself because that is integral to what is going on here in the Pacific campaign, the plane itself. And we'll talk about the operational environment uh, that these bombers are flying in. Uh, and of course, the capstone for today, we'll talk about Operation Meeting House in Tokyo uh, on the evening of March 9 and 10, 1945. And then, of course, some of the legacies the, as a result of, of this effort. Okay. So during the uh, first, or as a result of the First World War, we kind of want to avoid these uh, slogging it out through uh, the the trenches on the Western Front that we saw. And aerial combat in the First World War, and I've lifted this from another historian, is that aerial combat is shaped more by the war than whether by air combat shapes the war. Um, does it help in the war? Nah, I mean, it tactically, yes. But in terms of strategic air power, no, not at all. Um, it's these ideas of the, the dirigibles or the Zeppelin raids coming over, they create some fear, they create some havoc, but they don't really make a, a strategic impact in terms of materialism. Now, it does affect the British public, obviously, and you have Zeppelinitis comes around and you have this localized panic that occurs as a result uh, of these Zeppelin raids. However, um, in terms of actual material destruction, unless it was your house that get bombed, um, it's it's very little. However, with the the huge scar that the First World War leaves, not only with the British but with most of Europe um, itself, how do we avoid this? How do we avoid this um, uh, quagmire that we saw in the First World War? And of course, we all know that uh, Douay uh, comes up with the first treatise on strategic bombardment and. He advocates this idea of air bombardment and terror, uh, basically, by killing a lot of civilians. Um, and it will create such a horror that people will stop fighting. It's, it's a nice theory and it briefs well. Uh, and, of course, with his dark math, if you kill, you know, 250,000 men, women and children, that's better than killing 11 million men over four years. So, you know, that's his his rationale. And. and, and there's some reason to understand why he believes that. However, comma, um, the Americans take a different approach. Um, the Americans don't see killing of civilians at this time in the interwar years as a partic particularly e useful way um, of, of using air power. The Americans are going to focus on precision daylight bombing. And you can see here uh, on the screen here that we do believe the Americans, when I say we, uh, vital targets of, a, of the enemy economy do exist. They can be identified. We can hit them. We can penetrate enemy air defenses. If we bomb them accurate, uh, enough times, the enemy will capitulate. And this is the assumptions that the Americans go into with the Second World War. And you can see here in their interwar targeting analysis, you know, they, they kind of believe that this is not going to be a problem, i.e. precision. Okay. Um, and this comes out from the Air Corps Tactical School, which is in Maxwell Air Force Base or Maxwell Field uh, down in Alabama. And about 320 generals, uh, Army Air Corps generals go through ACT, which is about 80 percent of the graduates there, become general officers. And they downplay the Dewey idea and really embrace this idea of daylight precision. Okay. Um, they do study the wars in China and Spain and Ethiopia, um, and it helps kind of codify this daylight precision program. However, there are those distractors who don't see this as necessarily the best use of air power. And this is maybe when you start to see the arguments between the fighter mafia and the bomber mafia. You know, there are guys like Claire Chenault who really believe that fighter aviation is the way to go. And then there you have the guys like Larry Cooter um, and a lot of the framers of precision bombing who really think that uh, strategic bombardment is the way for the Air Force to go. Uh, but again, what we see is air power now is a way to avoid a large quagmire. And it's a relatively quick way to win if you are full uh, belief in the idea. It's a quick way to win, and I can buy a bunch of airplanes relatively cheaply, then I can buy a fleet of air, a fleet of ships. Okay. 
Um, and you can see here in this little uh, cartoon that uh, the Americans kind of believe their own propaganda here in September 26 in Collier's Magazine, if you can read the uh, uh, inscription, was at 106 or 107 Leap Geyser Straza. And we know that yeah, that's not really true. We know that now. Okay. With the, the Americans, of course, we all know about the development of the Norden bomb site, and we expect about 90% of bombs to land within one mile of the any point and 40% to land within 500 yards. Okay. Um, and again, this feeds this idea of precision bombing. Bombing. The director of the Air Corps Tactical School, Muir Fairchild, uh, says that killing people only produces temporary effects, and they're not necessarily cumulative in nature. And that the infrastructure is more important to destroy than killing people uh, as a whole. Uh, even as late as 1944. Sorry, this idea of precision bombing, um, how much of it is theory and that people are doing kind of equations on paper and how much of it is based on actual taking aircraft out and, you know, dropping flower bags yeah. of flour on targets in the desert? Excellent question. Um, give you an example here. They, they, you're not fighting anybody, you know, uh, in, in the clear skies over Southern California or, or Texas. Um, and there's a letter. I'm glad you brought that up because my current, um, book project I'm writing on LeMay's War Years. And uh, he writes a letter in January of 1943 to his mentor, a guy by the name of, of uh, Olds. And he says, life is much different when there are swarms of pursuits attacking you than flying in the clear air over Southern California. You know, like when somebody's actually shooting at you, it's different. And, and I'm glad you bring this up too, because I don't think we give enough concern to the air crew experience mm. in the second world war um you are a 21 22 maybe old bombardier navigator gunner whatever the case may be you're flying 10-hour missions depending upon where uh european theater or the pacific theater depends on you know the mission itself you're at altitude you're in a hostile environment and i don't mean in terms of flying over enemy territory you're flying at 20,000 feet where humans don't live. Yeah. And, and if you're in an unpressurized aircraft, everything is frozen. If you're in a B-29, it is pressurized. That's a little different. However, think about that young 22-year-old and what he is up against uh, flying these long missions, freezing or over uh, enemy territory. He's fighting the elements as much as he is fighting the enemy. And so to get back to your question, Paul, I think that has a big uh, factor in it because theoretically this stuff works when I'm flying over the United States. However, as we'll find out, when we fly over Japan and we find things like the jet stream and we find the meteorological conditions over Japan, I'll talk about this a little bit later on, the world is a little bit different. And so I, I don't think we've given enough uh, emphasis to – the air crew experience. And, and I'll say this too, you're scared. I would be. And I was a Marine yeah. officer for 22 years, you know? So I don't think you can subtract that from the mental calculus of what's going on uh, here. Uh, and the experience from the first world war is that about only 5% of British planes were shot down by anti-aircraft fire. And only 3% of German planes were shot down by anti-aircraft fire. So if you're using that as your, uh, your, uh, your precedent, oh, those numbers look pretty good. But as we well know, now you have the advent of radar and you have uh, anti-aircraft artillery fire that shoots even higher than what we had before. And you have integrated air defense because now you can have interceptors and radar guided and radar guided uh, uh, guns. And so the aerial environment has changed significantly from the First World War. Um, and so, again, I, I, I agree with you that when we look at what we develop as a theory, when we put that up against what these men actually experience, whether it be the European theater, or the Pacific theater, it is a day and night difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Um, how, getting back to the, the personnel issues, late as 1944, Larry Cooter, who again is one of the framers of strategic bombing theory, will say it is contrary to our national ideas to wage war against civilians. 
This is as late as 1944, okay? However, there are people who are starting to think that, well, it makes a lot of sense to kill skilled workers. Because if you think about a, a skilled lathe operator or a tool and die manufacturer, that gentleman is probably, or lady, as the case may go, it takes a while uh, for that person to become a skilled worker. And if you kill them, well, it takes another 18 or 20 years to make another adult worker. So, again, there is some dark math that's involved in this. Okay? And you can see here during the Air War Plans Division, they think it's perfectly feasible to target from 20 to 25,000 feet in the face of anti-aircraft artillery or fighter defenses. And we know that this is wrong. So this is where you have the theory. It's going to start running up against the reality really quickly. And here's an, a, a graphic uh, that shows this accuracy problems that the Allies have. Uh, specifically, this was more for the European theater. But you can see that this idea of precision really falls short. Um, and my argument uh, is that this idea of bombing area bombardment for the Americans is something that they slide into. We walk into the idea of the First World War with this idea of precision, but as we realize that the technology isn't quite there, the threat is much more difficult, the weather conditions are much more difficult, this idea of hitting close enough gains traction. It's okay. And here's something else I'll throw out to you. You're in the nose of that B-17 or the B-29, it doesn't matter, um, and you got to fly 25 missions before you come home, and you only get credit if you drop those bombs on the target, right? Well, what's your incentive? I'm dropping those bombs. You know, I mean, again, you're getting into human emotion here. Uh, and I'm not calling them cowards. That's not what I'm saying. Um, these guys have all my respect, but you're getting into the human element of warfare now. I think it's important to remember. Yep. Okay. Um, even under an, an Air Corps tactical school lesson plan, it will say, and I quote, Direct attack of civilian populations is the most repugnant to our human principles and certainly a method of warfare we would adopt only with great reluctance and regret. It's interesting that they say that, but they leave the door open. The door is still a little bit cracked, you know, to go after civilians. So just something to consider. Now, as we know, the British start the, the bombing effort uh, early on in the war before the Americans get involved. And the Butt Report, which comes out in September 1941, that's what it's called. Leave it alone. It's called the Butt Report. We find that only one in three aircraft get within five miles of the target and one in 10 aircraft get to the target. Okay, so it's pretty bad numbers for uh, RAF Bomber Command. Okay? Um, and as a result, they go to their nighttime bombing and they do the area bombardment. Um, and as a result, there is a, a doctrinal friction that occurs between what the Americans uh, see in their precision daylight bombing and what the British see. And at the uh, Casablanca conference in January 1943, Churchill is going to bring this issue up to FDR. Hap Arnold, who's the chief of staff of the Army Air Forces at this time, gets wind of this. And he directs the commander of the 8th Air Force, a guy by the name of Ira Aker, and he says, get down to Casablanca, go see Churchill, and tell him why this won't work. And Eker gets his uh, audience with Churchill, and Churchill leans back in his chair, and he says, you haven't proven to me that you're correct, but you've proven to me you should have the opportunity to prove your, con your contention. And as a result, he withdraws his petition, and the Allies put together what's called the Casablanca Directive, where the Americans will bomb by day and the British bomb by night. And so that's kind of the genesis of the combined bombing effort in the Pacific, or excuse me, in the, in the European theater, but it's going to bleed over into the Pacific. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about the B-29 itself. Not used in the European theater. There is one that has flown there, but only as a decoy. Um, but it's used almost exclusively during the war uh, in the Pacific theater. Unlike most people think about the um, uh, Manhattan Project, the B-29 is the single biggest expense of the United States in the Second World War. The atom bomb cost you $2 billion. The B-29 cost you $3 billion almost a third more, just for this airframe. 
okay? Um, which basically each airframe then costs about $600,000. In today's dollars, it's about $8 million a copy, which with today's fighters, that's pretty cheap. But at any rate, it was expensive for the time, okay? Um, this aircraft is incredibly complex, has over 40,000 different parts, has over a million rivets per airplane. In fact, 20% of the Boeing workforce was people riveting this aircraft. She had a number of subcontractors, uh, Frigidaire, uh, AC spark plugs, General Electric. Were all sub there were hundreds of subcontractors putting this very complex aircraft together. They had over 140 companies doing the subcontracting. And this aircraft, as you can see, they built almost 4,000 of them. And it requires a significant amount of American aviation production capacity. Okay. Hey, why is that important? I, I understand that you got to make the things, but here's why. Hap Arnold, who's the chief of staff of the Army Air Corps, is pushing for this bomber. It's going to work. Do you understand me? It's going to work. So this is going to start getting into some of the, the political piece on this, because there's an agenda here for the U.S. Army Air Force is to be an independent military service. And for Hap Arnold... He wants to have the strategic bombing effort make the biggest contribution to the war effort to serve as fodder for the post-war arguments over an independent air force. And the B-29 is part of this effort. Okay? So again, it's a very complex, very uh, expensive aircraft. And here you can see the size of it to a B-17. Okay. The max speed of a B-17 is about 287 miles an hour. The B-29, 350. The B-17 can go about 2,000 miles. The B-29, 3,200 miles. The bomb load of a B-17 is about 6, 000, or, uh, 6 tons. B-29, about 10 tons. So you can see this is a significant leap, not only in aviation capability, but it's also a significant leap um, in technology. Uh, not to mention, with it has some of the fused computer sites on it, remote controlled uh, turrets, um, a, uh, a, a pressurized cabin so the guys can fly without being on oxygen. Um, and so, again, there is a lot about this aircraft that is new and revolutionary that is done during the wartime period. And you can see here, as I talked about already, its range, its speed, its combat radius, its crew load. It is really a significant piece of, of new technology uh, at this time. One of the things that's going to really plague this thing, you can see it with the speed being 350 miles an hour. Its new engine, the R3350, is has about 2,200 horsepower per engine. However, it's a brand new engine. And like everybody knows, there's an old joke about aviators never fly the A model of anything. Okay, Well, this is the A model. Okay, so kind of put that as in your background uh, regarding aviation. Um, some of the things that she has available to are self-sealing fuel tanks, pressurized cabin, flush rivets. So it's very, very aerodynamically smooth. Um, there's no lap over of the metal that all the panels are flush riveted together. So it's very smooth on the surface. Um, and it, the early productions that come out require up to 54 major modifications before it even gets to frontline service. Um, mm -hmm. When uh, Curtis LeMay gets his hands on B-29s after his term uh, or his tour in the European theater, he will say, and I quote, the B-29 had as many bugs in it as the entomological department at the Smithsonian. Fast as we could get the bugs licked, new ones crawled out from underneath the cowling. If you ever saw a buggy aircraft, this was it, quote unquote, from Kurt LeMay on this. And this is part of the problem. This goes back to what I was saying. We start seeing the technology driving bombing strategy or bombing applications because of the technological limitations of the B-29. And we'll get more into this. Is it fair, John, to say... Because you've written a lot about post-war aviation as well, that the B-29 is more the first step of the post-war advances rather than the final step of the World War II advances. Is that is that yeah. kind of a fair statement? Yeah. I, I think that's that's fair to say because you look at I think the first flight is in '42. Um, the war's still going on, but we know it's not going to be uh, a frontline aircraft for a while yet. And actually, they're doing some of the testing while they're in combat. You know, so. 
that's something we don't tell advertise. And so to your point, um, it is a uh, huge step in aviation technology. The first intercontinental bomber, if you want to use that term, uh, the time they used it as a hemispheric defense weapon is the term they used at the time. Uh, and so it, it is, uh, and as you well know, it, it's the primary American bomber, you know, after the post-war period until the B-50 comes around. And even the B-50 is a significant departure from the B-29 design. They look the same, but they are significantly different. But the core design endures up until like the 19, into the early 1950s. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, again, as we move into the Pacific, we're going to follow the, the Air Force doctrinal precepts of daylight precision bombing. And you can see here Brigadier General Haywood Hansel, uh, who was LeMay's boss uh, in the Pacific theater, or excuse me, the European theater. Um, he's going to have the first command uh, flying B-29s out of the Marianas, uh, having 21st Bomber Command. As most of you know, there were there were B-29s in the China Burma India Theater flying out of Shengtu over to the uh, southern Japanese islands. But this is such a logistical nightmare that they shut this operation down. And Lemay's the one who tells Arnold, "You got to shut it down. This is not working." And only he has the moxie at that time to really do that. Um, but uh, Haywood Hansel is trying the precision daylight. Uh, applications over the Japanese islands uh, in the late uh, part of 1944, uh, November, December, and January. Uh, and he's not getting the results out of it that Arnold needs for to validate the expense of this bomber. And so he's fired um, in January 1945. And Arnold will say, and I quote, um, or LeMay will say, he was absolutely determined to get the results out of this weapon. The turkey is around my neck and I've got to deliver, quote unquote, from Kurt LeMay. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, we're going to fly B-29s out of Shengtu and hit the, the southern islands of Japan. Uh, but the problem is this is a bridge too far. Uh, to give you an idea of the route from Calcutta to Shengtu to southern Japan, it's the same uh, equivalent from going from L.A., to Little Rock, to Newfoundland here in the United States. It's quite the distance. Okay? And trying to get enough bombs, fuel, uh, maintenance support to Shengtu to support this because the Lido Road isn't open, um, it's just a logistical nightmare. And so as a result, uh, this thing is shut down relatively quickly um, and everything is moved to the Marianas. Now, that's going to have its own problems. And here's where we get into the bugginess um, of the aircraft. Early raids placed less than 10% of the bombs on their designated target. And part of this has to do with the distance involved, the design of the aircraft, and the maintenance capabilities that they have for this brand new airplane. Okay. You can see here, here's a B-29 uh, with one engine uh, out of commission and actually on fire. Uh, this is not an uncommon experience. As a matter of fact, uh, you will lose 414 B-29s in the war. Only 147 are, are, out, out, are down for enemy action. Two-thirds are lost to operational use, i.e. the plane broke. So if you consider most of the B-29s that are lost in the war are not from combat. They are from operational use. As I mentioned before, the B-29 had the, this engine called the R-3350, and one of the problems was, A, it was a new engine. B, they had some very poor quality control at the factories in which they were making it. They found out that some of the machinery, was the, the machines that make it, was out of calibration. And aviation tolerances are very small about what you can and can't have in terms of uh, spaces between uh, cylinder heads and, and crane cases and those kinds of things. And so they find that there's poor quality in the actual making of the, of the engine. There is poor design in the engine because what they have is exhaust gases actually blowing over the cylinders, which is causing cooling issues with the engine that already runs hot as it is. Uh, and so what they're having a lot of is, is crankcase fires because the engine's overheated. Now, that leads to another problem. Those crankcases are made out of magnesium. Magnesium burns very, very hot. 
And even the fire extinguisher system in the B-29 can't deal with the with the temperatures that are involved with burning magnesium. Okay. Um, and so if you have a burning engine, it will probably burn through the firewall and into your fuel tank. So this is a significant problem. Another problem you have with the B-29's engine is you're flying in the Pacific. Just like me learning here in New Orleans, it's hot and it's humid. And engines don't like hot and humid. It's what you call high density altitudes. And these engines are not producing the horsepower needed to climb to altitude or even lift off, quite frankly. And I was reading a letter from LeMay uh, when he was in the China Burma India Theater, and he and he tells a uh, Hap Arnold, the crews don't talk about combat. They talk about the fact that their aircraft was able to get airborne given the high density altitudes and their bomb loads. So it kind of tells you something about the problematic nature uh, of the engine. Another problem they had was the feathering system in the B-29. You might ask, okay, what does feathering mean? Well, normally, you know, when you're flying in an aircraft, the propeller's pr producing uh, thrust to make you go forward. The blade is cutting into the air. The problem is if that engine stops producing thrust and the oil uh, system stops pumping cooling oil, that propeller blade will continue to turn and will continue to generate friction. And the problem is if the blade, when you feather it, it goes parallel to the wind and therefore the blade won't turn. If you can't get it to feather, the blade will continue to turn. It will eventually seize up, turn red, and it will actually yank the whole engine out of the wing of the aircraft itself. So there's, again, here's another problem on top of another problem on top of another problem. Okay. And John, just to interrupt you again, John, because I, I like interrupting. Sure. It seems like my, my, I'm not the aviation guy, but what I do know is mostly ETO is there's a, a very limited ability to kind of bring in experience and anything, any advice from anything that's going to have any bearing on what they're doing at all. Whereas you look at the ETO, the British have been evolving from Blenheims to Manchester's and Lancaster's and Halifax's and the Americans have started with B-17Cs and Ds and Es and Fs and Gs and the missions have got, the ranges are greater and greater. And there's a certain amount of of learning on the job and sharing of information alongside. And it, it seems to me the Pacific, this is, this is the very definition of on-the-job training and on-the-job at the most extended ranges, the most difficult uh, um, conditions, with these aircraft that are themselves um, straight off the production lines and not yet uh, working properly, it's it's a huge amount of, of hurdles that this bombing force has to overcome. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And not only that, we're, we're talking about the airframe. You also think about this. you got to have a, a qualified mechanic who knows how to fix that engine. And think yeah. about that workforce. And LeMay doesn't even have those guys. Matter of fact, when he gets to the China Burma India Theater, he shuts down bombing operations thing for a month just to have guys go through the manuals, just to have them get familiar with the aircraft systems. You know, and this is all it's you know, it's not like flying a Piper Cub and then taking it off to a 747. You can't do that. You know, and so you think about how air air power is a system from the factory to the pilot, to the mechanic, to the air traffic controllers, to the guy who makes the runway, all these things have to come together. And you're absolutely right. There's no precedent for this aircraft um, because, like I said, we're flying the A model of the B-29. And, and think about the maintenance men who have to fix this darn thing. Um, and, and so there's lots of problems here, again, that are more operational. I haven't talked about combat yet. We haven't even bombed the Japanese city yet for the most part. You see where I'm going with this. So to me, and this is why um, the technology, and we'll get into this, why LeMay is going to start doing something new and unusual here. Okay. Here's uh, the Marianas. You can see down here in Iwo Jima, uh, up where the, where the dog leg is. And we're at the, as you mentioned uh, earlier, Paul, we're at the range of the B-20. We're pushing it to its maximum envelope in terms of range and speed and capability. Now, here's another problem you have, uh, the weather. Now, granted, those of you who live in Europe, weather sucks, except right now it's nice and hot. Sorry about that, guys. Um, but in Japan, you have two kinds of weather, summer and winter. Okay. Well, in the wintertime, what happens is this cold air comes down from Siberia. It meets with the warm air of the Pacific. And what you have in the southern part of the islands there are these towering weather fronts. 
And as most of you know, flying through a thunderstorm is a bad thing, especially if you're in an unproven aircraft. And so you have these problems of aircraft trying to penetrate these weather fronts um, on their way to uh, the main island themselves. Okay, well, what about if you fly in the summer? All right, we did that. Now, all the weather front kind of pushes north. And what you see is these cloud patterns now form over Japan itself proper. And so you have a problem with the visual piece of this. Remember, I'm using a Norden bomb site. I'm looking visually through, you know, my reticle. And the first eight, tax, first eight attacks in late 1944 and early 1945, they experienced nine-tenths cloud coverage, solid cloud coverage, solid cloud coverage again, eight-tenths, eight-tenths, and six-tenths. Those were the first six missions. According to LeMay, this is the worst bombing world, bombing weather in the world. And uh, during his first few months there, he said uh, for the first six weeks, they only had one visual shot at a target. So on top of the problems I just gave you with regard to the aircraft itself, I also got a weather problem. Okay, And I'm not done with weather problems yet. Hold on, folks. We've, we're flying at 20,000, 30,000 feet in this part of the Pacific. And guess what we're finding? The jet stream. And the jet stream is right around 30,000 feet. Of course, it depends on the, the weather, the altitude, and its speed. It can go as high as 230 miles an hour. And so a lot of times these guys are flying around. They realize their ground track is only like 100 knots. It's because they got such a headwind coming in from the jet stream that they're not even making any progress. Okay. Uh, so as a result, you're finding out that maybe flying at high level, trying to bomb through clouds is a little bit of a problem. And if you're at altitude as well, the uh, Norden bomb site is good for a 35 degree wind drift. But however, if you want to counter some of these winds, you got to fly at a 45 degree with, uh, drift on your bomb site, which is problematic for accuracy. So, we got a buggy airplane, we got crappy weather, and we got, you know, the jet stream. So you kind of put these things together, you can see why this is a problem. And go back to LeMay's comment about Hap Arnold, the turkey's around my neck. I got to make this thing work. And, and there's, there's never any consideration at all of abandoning the whole concept of B-29 bombing job. Too much money is going into it, so it's it's just going to have to keep on going till, it's, till, it, till it finds its groove, I guess, yeah? That's it. We're This thing's, remember, it's going to work. I told you that. Yeah. It's going to work. So, you know, to be you're, honest, that's, yeah. that, we've thought about this on World War II TV, TV before. That's very much something we can look at the Allies and say they didn't ever throw the baby out with the bathwater. They had tank designs that weren't brilliant at the beginning but got better. They had aircraft designs that started off a bit iffy but got better. Doctrine, tactics, even leadership. There was a, a, a general idea that we would work at things and improve them until they got better, which is maybe not something we can direct to the, ja the Germans and possibly the Japanese who kind of, oh, yeah, that doesn't work. We'll do, it. We'll do a new one. And, uh, yeah. and they just straight off the design... Uh, a new thing. So our persistence, I think, gets there's a tortoise and the hare approach. I think we do kind of always get there, us allies. Yeah. And something else I'll throw it to you, climbing up to altitude, getting back more to the aircraft. If you climb up to altitude, it's more stress on the engine. And aircraft are cooled by molecules of air going over the fins. And now you're in rarefied air. So you have that problem. So maybe, LeMay thinks, maybe if I lower the altitude, I can avoid the clouds. I can avoid the jet stream. I'm not putting as much stress on my airframe and my engine at flying at these higher altitudes and hauling that fuel up to 30,000 feet. And when he does that, aircraft availability goes from 60% to 83%. So now you're getting into fleet management. How do you manage an air fleet? How do you maintain an air fleet? And, oh, by the way, if I'm not carrying that much fuel, guess what else I can carry then? More bombs. Bombs, yeah. Because I'm not flying up at altitude. See, I'm going with this. Now, we know that Japan has paper structures. We know that. We know that from the, the uh, earthquakes in the 1920s. It's well known. And, of course, uh, we start developing a little something called uh, napalm, and most of you know the, the story of that. And the Committee of Operational Analysis, which is a bunch of guys from MIT, Princeton, Harvard, and, uh, and the OSS, 
they're going to study this and look at maybe firebombing techniques. And they're going to build little Japanese cities called little Tokyos. And they're going to start dropping this napalm stuff on them, this jelly gasoline, and see how effective it is. And they actually bring in local fire departments and say, okay, go put the fire out. And when the fire departments say, hey, it's too hot, we can't do it, that's what we wanted. You know, that, that proves our case. Uh, and so what happens is DuPont, Standard Oil, and the National Defense Committee develop what's called the M69 incendiary weapons. And by the later stages of the war, 70% of the bombs drop will be incendiary, obviously over Japan. Okay, And found out that, uh, you know, we can really wreak havoc upon the Japanese infrastructure or the towns by dropping napalm. And this is a schematic of one of those little Tokyos. Uh, Dugway Proving Grounds in Utah. So we actually did some research. We had people come who had lived in Japan and help us construct these, these mock cities and light them on fire. Okay. And you can see here we do we do some recon and where are those flammable areas of Tokyo at? Where are the industry where's the industry at and where do people live? And so you're gonna see uh, the G2 people, the targeting people start to figure out where the Japanese infrastructure really is. And here you can see pictures of some incendiary bombs being loaded up in the belly of a B-29. These are M-50s. But what happens is these are little bomblets that are all strapped together. And when they reach a certain altitude, those bands break away and these little bomblets come out. And in them are set as a sack of, of napalm. Uh, and what happens is when they finally hit their target, the igniter hits and these things catch on fire and they burn at like 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can't even put them out. Now, Operation Meeting House, March 9 and 10, 1945. You're in, uh, we're going to go after the Tokyo urban area, low level, as we stated. Why? Nighttime, well, cover of darkness. We know the Japanese uh, do have air defense, but instead of going in the daytime, let's go at night. OK, and we're going to use our incendiaries. And at this time, OK, Kurt LeMay and most of the Air Force is very is, is convinced that the Japanese still have cottage industries, meaning mom and dad are making uh, piston rings for German or excuse me, for Japanese fighters or they're making, you know, uh, uh, fuel lines for f ships or whatever. And they did do that for a while. They did. However, by this time in the war, the Japanese have, are contracting that and going back to their feeder factories. But we don't know that. So right now, hitting Japanese cottage industries is a legitimate target to what the American targeters know at this time. Okay, So that's why they're going after urban areas, because we know that they have lathes there and they have machine shops in their houses. And so as a result, we're going to go ahead and attack those urban areas. They're going to fly in between five and 9,000 feet. On March 9 and 10, they're going to drop a half a million M69s, uh, and they're going to drop them in a single file as they fly over uh, the Japanese capital there. Most people will die from carbon monoxide poisoning as the fire sucks the oxygen. They die of smoke uh, inhalation. Uh, it requires uh, uh, some of the updrafts are so powerful that the uh, some B29s are broken. One has its wing spar broke because the updraft is is uh, so uh, uh, violent. Uh, 90 flyers are killed, 14 aircraft go away, and they lose about 4.6% of the attack force. LeMay predicts that they were going to lose about 5%, so he was not far off. But let me give you a, a, a description here of what happened because uh, it, it bears uh, uh, mentioning. Uh, on that raid, most died horribly as the intense heats from the firestorm consumed oxygen, boiled water in the canals, and set liquid glass rolling down the streets. Thousands suffocated in shelters or parked as panicked crowds crushed victims who had fallen into the streets as they surged towards the waterways to escape the flames. Perhaps the most terrible incident came when one B-29 dropped seven tons of incendiaries around the crowded Kokotai Bridge. Hundreds of people will turn into fiery torches and splashed into the river below in sizzling hisses. One writer described the falling bottles as resembling tet caterpillars that had been burned out of a tree. Tail gunners were sickened by the sight of hundreds of Japanese people burning to death in the flaming napalm floating on the surface of the Sumida River. B-29 crews in the superheated drafts 
uh, struggled with their aircraft, with at least 10 aircraft being destroyed. Many of the crew had to wear oxygen masks to avoid vomiting from the stench of the burning flesh. By the time the attack had ended, almost 16 square miles of Tokyo were burnt out and over 1 million people were homeless. And here's a picture that's in the American uh, uh, Air Force magazine at the time talking about the burnt out area of Tokyo the morning after. So 7% of Tokyo was raised in one night or 16 square miles. Uh, in the 10 times they attacked Tokyo before then, they only had about 1,300 deaths in Tokyo. In one night, the Americans will kill 84,000 people in one night. 40,000 will be injured and 250,000 buildings will be destroyed. One crewman reported, as far as the eye could see, there was a sea of flame, a mass of roaring fire that covered the city like a cauldron. How could this fire ever be put out? How could anyone possibly live through this hell? Wow. And here is an immediate uh, picture during the strike. You can see the city ablaze. And to put more of a, a note on this, here's what Tokyo looks like. You can see the buildings built out of concrete or masonry or brick and those that are not. Wow. And, and just to interrupt you, John, and remind our, folk, our viewers, uh, James M. Scott, his new book, Black Snow, is on yes. the result of the fire. And he'll be coming on in, I think, September to talk about the impact. You, you, you John, are giving us a great presentation about the air power and its use. And, and James will do, probably do a little bit of that, but he'll also particularly be focusing on the impact of this. And, and but before I kind of let you move on again, you're going back to this these early problems of the beta and either teething problems, this decision to go ahead with Meeting House in March 1945, if, if, the, if it had been possible to do that, let's say 18 months or even a year earlier, would the, would the same go ahead but have been given from, from your point of view? Or did, did the Allies need to have got to the point where they've seen some of the things in Saipan, Iwo Jima and the, yeah. the suicides of cliffs and things like that? Was there a certain amount of... of, of um, events having to have taken place to, to kind of shift the, the opinion behind this tactic? Yeah, I, um, I'm from the school of thought, and, I, and I when I teach any classes on the Pacific, I tell my students, this is a race war at its core. We hate right. them. They hate us. That's all there is to it. I mean, yes, there's all the political manifestations. I get it. But we look down on them as, as barbarians, and they look upon us as the same thing. Yeah. There's animosity on both sides. And, of course, the Americans have already seen what happened in, in China, what happened to the occupation of you know, Nanking and, and those things. And so in the American um, perspective, there are no good Japanese. OK, there are good Germans and bad Germans, but there are no good Japanese. Again, there's a racial component here. Um, that, that I think it is part and parcel of this. And by 1945, so, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. So just by 1945, <laughs> um, here's a question that I throw out to, to my students. By 1945, you've been in this war now for four years. Do you care anymore? Yeah. Do you care? Because your brother, your uncle, your cousin is either on a troop ship or maybe he's dead. And now we've got to fight these guys. You know what I mean? And so most Americans they're kind of immune to this. I'm, I'm not saying that they're, they're, they're thirsting for this, but by the time 45 rolls around, this gets to be kind of the norm. Yeah. No, I think I'm with you. And I think, you know, as, a, as an affirmed ETO guy, I mean, by, by, by March, 1945, I mean, in the ETO, something like 30% of American troops fighting in the, in, in Europe had German extraction or at least European Dutch or Italian. So they're now been starting to liberate German cities. They're starting to see the effects of, of war. They're starting to experience the joys of liberation. And I think in some ways you could say in the ETO, the anger towards the Germans is kind of lessening, although then there's the, the peak when they start liberating the, uh, the, the concentration camps and death camps. But I think in the Pacific, 
my understanding is the rage a lot of allied soldiers and airmen felt just kind of keeps on building and building there's no point where it kind of eases off if anything as the end in sight gets closer it just it just fires up pun no, bad pun intended uh, with the subject yeah. but this kind of hatred and venom yeah and, and you think about pearl harbor so the gloves are off in December 7th, you know, uh, and so this is for if for you're an American. Hey, this is your just desserts. You you, des you brought this on yourself. So, again, I'm, I'm talking about the American mindset at the time, you know, and you can't, you know, if you look at the Claus and you know, the enmity of the people, there's certainly this enmity here, you know, and, and, and so most Americans don't have a problem with this. As a matter of fact, the next morning uh, after matter of fact, LeMay is, is very concerned when he, when he launches these guys that night. He says, and I quote, um, I've never had a I've, I've never had a level of anxiety I never wish to experience again because he doesn't know this is an experiment. And when it turns out gangbusters from an American perspective, he writes half Arnold and he says, hey, this is what happened. And Arnold re responds back and he says, congratulations on your fine result. This proves that you and your crews have the guts to do anything. Keep up the fine work. And it gives you an idea of the mindset at this time. I'm not blaming these guys, but this is part and parcel of war. Okay. Well, uh, and a question did... on from um, uh, Prima Kin Sophie saying, the Tokyo raid only had such high casualties due to the creation of a firestorm. If the firestorm doesn't happen and firestorms were rare freak events, the casualty total would have been far lower. What's your response to that? Um, I... Well, yeah, the firestorms occurred in, in the European cities, too. We all know about Hamburg. We know about Dresden, um, you know. But the thing is, because the British or the, the German cities are made out of, out of brick and, and, and mortar, they weren't as susceptible. But the Japanese ones certainly are. And the firestorm is going to feed into that. And as I said, most of these people are dying from the lack of oxygen. They're not being burned together. As you can see here, a lot of these people aren't necessarily burned. Many of them are, of course. But look at the ones that are in the river. They jump in the river to get away from the flames. The problem is the flames are made of uh, the, the petroleum floats on water. These people are robbed of oxygen, you know. And so, yeah, the firestorm is part and parcel of this, but this is not necessarily a new phenomenon to strategic bombing in the Second World War. You are in the Pacific. You also saw it in, in Dresden and in Hamburg and places like that as well. Yeah. Um, and we're going to continue on to burn more Japanese cities. We're going to go to Osaka and Kobe and Nagoya. Uh, a few days later, we're going to go to Nagoya. We're going to uh, burn uh, only uh, five square miles. But again, we're learning how to do this now. We're getting our feet underneath us. As a matter of fact, LeMay continues to do this. Uh, as you can see here in these uh, other cities, a few days later, he goes to Osaka, uh, a city of about 3.2 million people, and he burns eight square miles. 4,000 shops and factories are burned. Okay? And you can see here the Japanese infrastructure or the urban landscape that once was is now gone. In just five missions, LeMay is going to launch 1,434 sorties, burn 30 square miles at the cost of 20 B-29s. Just 20 B-29s. Between March 9 and June 15, 1945, six, almost 7,000 B-29 sorties will drop 41,000 tons of incendiaries and raise 102 square miles of Japanese urban infrastructure. And to give you a comparison, if you're in the United States, Tokyo is about as big as New York. 51% of New York is destroyed. L.A. is about as big as Nagoya, 40% of Nagoya. And you can see the rest of those statistics as we go down. For all B-29 missions, they're going to raise almost 200 square miles of Japanese cities, uh, uh, 600 factories, 18 oil centers, and 66 major cities. And here's what the strategic bombing survey says about, and I just kind of repeated some of these things for you. 30% of the population lost, lost their homes. 800,000 casualties. Japanese combat deaths at the hands of the Americans is only 780. Think about that. Mm. Women and children and men, of course, but. Wow. And, to, and since you're going to have on, uh, guess next guest speaker, we're going to cure more people 
in the firebombing than we do in either Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the initial blast. I'm not talking about the after effects of radiation because that's a whole other uh, number. But if you look at this, look how many people we kill or injure on the Tokyo raid on March 9 and 10 compared to the initial blast of either Hiroshima or Nagasaki. That gives you scale and scope um, about how effective this was in terms of destruction. Okay. And here's what LeMay says about it. Yeah. And this is a moral debate we have today. Whether you're a strategic bomber or you're a brigade commander on the ground or whatever, you know, where where does that breakover part begin between co effective combat operations and morality? And these are things that all commanders have to struggle with. And I was going to ask you that, John, because, I mean, we're getting towards the end now. Is that any discussion about this and indeed the atomic bombs, which will continue with tomorrow, it's just very emotive. It's very, there's the, the language used, firebombing is just a horrible phrase that just, it, it, it causes pain to my ears. That even when you started off, civilian uh, targets is a, is a horrible phrase we don't like hearing. And yet, of course, people are mentioning the Japanese barbarism towards allied prisoners of war. They're men, you know, talking about how many people were killed by Japanese swords in, in World War II. There's emotion, deep emotion running on both sides. And everybody who's listening today and watching today, they're, they're my audience. So I like to think they're, they're objective and they're good people. But this subject brings out such emotive language so you know you say you you know you've taught this how how difficult is it to just try and analyze this for what it is without that emotion just yeah. overwhelming like a like a like a like a volcano yeah if i if i may and i don't mean to step on your next uh, discussion on atomic bomb but when they they when they survey the americans uh in august or september of 1945 should we drop the atomic bomb i think it was like 88 percent of americans go yeah but then six months later that number drops like 60%. Yeah. You know, war is over. Your, bro your brother or your husband is now home. And so I guess you have to look at it from a difference of being engaged in war as opposed to, oh, we won the war. Now we can, you know, look at this thing from more of a moral perspective. But again, I, I would make the argument that in the spring of 1945, you didn't care. And I'm being general, but most Americans, this does not bother. There are some that do protest. They are. And they're largely, you know, pushed to the side because this is a race war. Go back to what we were talking about. Uh, and so this is, like you said, it's emotive, you know. And of course, if your brother was killed at Guadalcanal or was, uh, was uh, you know, an Iron Bottom Sound, you know, on the Navy ship, damn right. You know, again, this is just part of the emotive piece of it. But I think what's also important here in this legacy piece, as we threshold into atomic bombs, Civilians are now legitimate targets. End of story. Because of modern armies are mechanized, required industrial base, require workers, require natural resources that come from a country. It makes sense to kill skilled workers. Yeah. You know, despite the morality issues involved with that. And so this kind of opens the threshold for atomic bombardment. And even in um, the interim committees that are helping Truman determine you know, the atomic bomb issue, it's never a question of should we? It's a question of where and when. If you read the interim committee notes, it's all about, well, when are we going to drop them? Um, because the Japanese aren't showing any signs of abating. And the one of the arguments is, what difference does it make whether it's fusion as the ignition source or a conventional weapon? We killed 84,000 in one night through conventional bombing. What difference does it make if it's fission? You know, and so... These kind of arguments are coming up as well. And it's going to, and the way I look at it, it paves the way for what we see in the post war world with this acceptance of aerial bombardment, nuclear uh, warfare, and of course, the, we get into the Cold War in the 1950s and so on. But I, I think it's interesting that as late as 1945, Secretary of War Henry Stimson says the reputation of the U.S. for fair play and human humanitarianism is its biggest asset for peace in the coming decades. I believe the same rule of sparing the civilian population should be applied. So it's interesting that, you know, we, we're walking an awfully thin line here. And if you want to say it's even contradictory, you certainly could. Again, I understand the rationale. 
And if I was a commander in 1945, I probably would have said the same thing. Um, however, now I have, I'm a historian. I can look back a little bit and have some perspective on it. Um, so, uh, um, and you think about too, the atomic bomb, this whole idea of, well, we have to invade Japan. Oh my gosh, that's going to go into 1946, maybe 1947. And the Americans are already tired of the war. They don't want to do this anymore. They, you know, we beat the Germans. We know the Japanese are going to be close, but yet they're still saying, no, we're not going to quit. So Truman, in my opinion, has, it's, it's a non-decision. He's got to drop it. Because if he does it and the Japanese continue one to 46 and 47, and then a mother or father says, that, wait a minute, my son was killed invading Kyushu, and you had a bomb and you didn't drop it? He's going to have to answer for that. Whether yeah. at the polls in 1947, 1948, and you spend two billion dollars, you got to answer for that too. So you can see this: it, the fire bombing kind of opens the, the threshold, I think, for later on nuclear applications. No, definitely, and, and I'll be interested to hear Paul Ham's take on things tomorrow. And it, it'll be different to yours, and there'll be some overlap, and there'll be some differences. But that's the that's the you know, we said at the beginning that the history is all about opinions. But I think with this subject and. And being British and James Jeffries, who's watching today, who does talks with me about Bomber Command, as soon as Dresden comes up on a conversation on Twitter or Facebook, every, everything escalates. It gets a little bit angry. People start getting a bit, you know, hot under the collar yeah. and things like that. And the same thing applies with this. And again, it's the language, you know, you said it, Minico, the emotive language, firebombing is a horrible word and things like that. But it, it, as you said there, right at the beginning, I think, bringing you back to what you said, you've got to judge these events by what was the perception at the time when they were in the middle of the war. And as you said there, the fact that even six months later, public opinion was changing is is fascinating and, a, and, a, and an insight into how quickly as human beings we adapt and we move on and we accept the, the new normal uh, and the yeah. new normal fighting the war is very different to the new normal of the war is over. We know we know, yeah, that end had come, the relief is, and we realized, hang on, maybe we could have took our, taken our, our foot off, feet off the gas slightly in that last bit there. But um, bringing it back to, you know, where you are with history, you know, you're writing about the post-war period. You know, I said, you know, you said you hadn't really changed your thinking on this. Um, is, is there more debate? Is there going to be more analysis coming out of this that's going to bring anything new to this debate, or have we got all the information now? There's are there any still files that are still sealed up? Yes, there are. The, um, I, I have a, a colleague friend of mine who's been doing um, a yeoman service to the firebombing campaign, who uh, recently came across a number of files at the Air Force Academy, uh, Haywood Hansel's papers that have been under seal for a long time, uh, and he and I have been talking and. Um, He's finding some very interesting correspondence, and I won't. It's his research, so I don't want to divulge anything. But there, there are some things that are coming out that he's finding out in terms of the the lower level discussions amongst commanders on this stuff. Um, and there, I actually found some records in the Library of Congress that have yet to be uh, publicized. Frankly, because they're on these floppy records that you bought as a kid that you used to listen to stories on. And they don't have the technology to play these interviews back of the guys, right. in the, you know. So, yeah, so there is more out there. But again, I, I am not going to, you know, ruin his, you know, pitch on what he has found on it. So, yes, there is more out there to be found uh, about this application. But I agree with you. I think it serves as a, a wonderful, a wonderful, but as a, as a good example of the human, the inhumanity that we can inflict on the people of others, the others, you know, they're not like us, they're animals. And so the, you look at John Dower's War Without Mercy, he does a wonderful job of talking about how we demonize the Japanese and, and they did the same thing to us, you know, and I think it says something about the, the human, the nature of, of humanity, which is scary sometimes, quite frankly. No, definitely. And I'm, I'm thinking, although it's about the ETR, I'm thinking about Adam Tooze's book, Wages of Destruction, which for me yes. is one of the game changing books that, you know, when we are taught for years about the, the mor morality of, of, of killing German civilians, is the whole economy, the whole Nazi economy, everybody was involved from bus drivers to munitions yeah. work. Everybody. And it's the, the same could be applied in some ways to the Japanese. You know, That's yes, true. there's that face of the, the 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 Japanese soldier with the rifle with the bayonet at the at the sharp yeah. end, but then well, there's that whole mechanism behind it. And, behind war, it. War and, is in, and in one April 1945, the Japanese D unanimously passes legislation that mobilizes every man, woman, and child. Now, if you're an American commander, 
I don't have any choice. I mean, that's what you're being told. And after the pots, or after the, the the Japanese response to the Potsdam Declaration is, we don't care. We're not quitting. Okay, I, what do you want me to do? If I'm a commander and I'm responsible for human life, American lives, you know, um, I have a mission to, you know, you, you can't blame them for this as practitioners of, of violence, which is what military commanders are. Yeah, so I think my final question for you is, you, you know, you talked about how long the B-29 was in development. We're going to have Kit Chapman talk about the Manhattan Project and when yeah. that started. So in many ways, the debate about the shoulds and shouldn'ts of the, of the firebombing and the atomic bombs is, is the tech the tech was in place and was building up for it for at least a couple of years before that. So it's kind of it gets to the point where eventually they're going to use it. It's it's like yeah. when people in, in, in Europe talk about the market garden plan being imperfect. The thing is, an allied airborne army had been created in, in July and August. It was going to get used somewhere. It got used at Market Garden, but there was no question of, of not using that force in some capacity. And I think the same thing could easily apply. Once you've got the B-29, its range comes into it. Once the technology for, for incendiaries, once the technology of atomic comes in, it, it's, all, it's, all, it's all leading to a fi an obvious final conclusion, I think. Yeah, and that's just and go back to the point uh, I, I was making. You know, I was kind of joking, but it's going to work. I yeah, told you so. this thing's going to work. I put if you're half Arnold, I put my my personal and professional reputation on the line. Not to mention a significant part of the American industrial capacity for aviation. Not to mention three billion dollars. So this thing's going to work, you know. And so there is a an organizational momentum outside of the military applications. That's pushing this as well. So to to to, to uh, uh, underscore your point. Yeah. No, I think. Well, I think we'll we'll leave it there. We're just we both of us reminding our viewers is that always. I was reading on Twitter this morning. In fact, it's the principle of history is to try and approach it knowing the facts they had at the time mm -hmm. and not adding to that information the facts that we know of what happened even as as, as soon as a week later. Uh, things in warfare change incredibly speedily, and what was the rule one week can be completely different the next week. So it's that trying to be objective, trying to look at it and understand the decisions they were, they were making at the time, and how personally involved these people were. Those quotes you're giving from Kurt, Curtis LeMay, and you know that, that they were taking this war very personally. Anybody who was in that theater was quite rightly taking in that war very personally. Some of the people who are watching this show today in their 20s and 30s don't need to take World War II personally because their fathers and mothers, their grandfathers and grandmothers weren't involved. So it all can become, to some extent, an, a, a case of academic study and analysis. But for anybody who was there, there was no, there was no means of being objective because no. you, you had family caught up in it somewhere. Sure. Absolutely. Again, that's why I'm a big fan of Clausewitz. He talks about this idea of the the enmity that people can feel. You got the government with the with the objectives, and you got the army that does it. But if people are behind you and they have that hate, yeah, it, it's certainly helpful, at least for in terms of military applications. So yes, well, brilliant. Well, we will bring soon, and I'll just take you off screen for a minute, remind people what we got coming up to, and I'll bring you back on in a second. So, okay. folks. Another double bill coming your way tomorrow. So tomorrow, continuing this theme at 10 a.m. UK time, Paul Ham, the Australian historian, is coming on to talk about his opinion about the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings. And that will be interesting. If nothing else, it will provoke some lively debate. And then the evening, 7 p.m. UK time, Dr. Kit Chapman, who's been on recently talking about weird animal weapons, is on to talk about the man <laughs> So that's that. That's tomorrow's show. We've got more stuff coming up about the Marine uh, Aviation Squadron with Peleliu with Damon Stout and Henry Sledge. And another show, I'm going to schedule another one for Friday. Looks like it's happening now about the the uh, uh, a new book that's come out about the uh, Allied prisoners of war who were victims of the Nagasaki bombing. So that's an extra yeah. show. Yeah. Link. so that's coming up so if you're new to the channel don't forget to subscribe the links to my guests websites their books is always in the description below i urge you to go out and look at some of john's uh book writing and articles and there are other lectures on youtube he's done some similar things to what he did for you but in, in other settings i i urge you to go and look for his work on youtube but i'm gonna bring dr john back in to say um thank you very much john and we got there thank with you. a technology issues and would you like to come back on the world war ii tv and, and absolutely give us some i love it absolutely Be happy to oh, thank you very much so this is paul Woodadge for world war ii tv saying i'll see you all again tomorrow everybody uh, so cheers everybody thanks for cheers. watching bye bye